Okay, so here we are recording, and let me record here. Recording in progress. Recording, okay. Shana Tova, everyone. Welcome back to our weekly Bezad Hashem, our weekly Shior, Bakol Mikol Kol. I hope everyone had an incredibly uplifting and meaningful Chag. And if for any reason you did not, don't be disheartened because every day is a new gift and every day a new opportunity. So regardless of whether you were at home taking care of kids or you were in the shul or wherever you were, Hashem was with you. And that's the most important thing to know that um, regardless of what our, our perceived ideas are about the quality of our Chag, we have to know that no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, Hashem is with us. And so we can make the most of our experience, for better or for worse, and turn it into something very meaningful and positive moving forward. So I want to um, begin by just asking you, does anybody want to say hello or share any significant, meaningful experiences that might have happened over the Chag? Um, it could be now, it could be later. I just want to throw that out there because I believe, you know, as I've said from the beginning, uh, we can all learn from each other and it's very important for us to learn from each other. So if there's any little tidbit that you read, anything that struck you in the davening, anything that someone said to you, any insight you gained over the course of this incredibly um, intense, you know, weeks of Chagim, and of course, the whole month of Elul when we were preparing. So by all means, you're welcome to um, either say it out loud or if you prefer, you can post it in the chat. Um, either one is, is more than welcome. So um, I want to, did anyone want to share anything off the bat? Not yet, maybe we'll get warmed up <laughs> first. Okay, oh, here, hold on, I see. Incredible beginning of a journey, amazing. Hold on, I don't know why my screen is like being funky. Let me see if I can get to that. Amazing, okay. Um, so so let's begin. So um, I wanna, obviously, I, I always like to begin with Hakaras Tov and thanks. And so um, as we come off of the Chagim, I wanna express my Hakaras Tov uh, and thanks to Hashem, to HaKadosh Baruch Hu for enabling us to come back together at this time, for us to have gone through all the Chagim safely, Bezad Hashem and be able to find ourselves back together is a huge blessing. Um, and we are still obviously anxiously awaiting the arrival of Mashiach Sidkenu and that we hope that the work that we're doing together will not only strengthen ourselves and strengthen our families and strengthen our communities, um, but will will usher in the, the Mashiach um, and that we'll, we'll merit, God willing, to, to see him and live in, in the times of, of Mashiach. Um, I have to be completely transparent in that I actually don't have um, set notes yet for today. I, I, as all of you, I've been incredibly um, busy with the Chagim and my kids are still home from school, as I'm sure some of yours are as well. And so I do have some ideas today of what I would like to put out. Um, it'll be a shorter class than, than typical, um, but I didn't want to miss the opportunity um, to have this, uh, this time together. Um, and and so to get us back into a routine as quickly as possible, um, God willing to be able to um, have the class live and then the recordings for anyone who is not able to attend in person. So today, as I was looking up at Tzadikim, um, uh, I, it came to my attention that today is the Hiula of Rav Chaim Zanvil, Ben Reb Moshe Ve'yitza Tzipora. And um, if you're not familiar, Rav Chaim Zanvil is the Ribnitzer Rebbe. And I learned about the Ribnitzer Rebbe actually from my daughter, uh, who is an avid reader and reads about the biographies of Tzadikim. And um, she told me, she, she read his book, and um, he is a man, uh, was a man of Nisim and Niflaus and Yeshuos. Um, the stories about him are countless and they are absolutely remarkable. The things he did for people, how he helped people, his devotion to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, his Avodas Hashem. In particular, if you take the time to read about him, which I highly, highly recommend that you do. 
Um, his Avoda Samikva was beyond um, comprehension in, in my eyes. Um, he actually spent about 10 years living in Los Angeles, just a few blocks away from here. So the fact that he walked on these streets where I live is, is very exciting. And believe it or not, even though he lived in Eretz Yisrael, he's actually buried in um, the Vizna Cemetery in Muncie, New York. And I've had the opportunity to go and visit his kever. It is incredibly a holy experience. If you ever have the opportunity to go and to visit his kever, I highly recommend it. The cemetery itself ha has tremendous kedusha. There are many different tzaddikim buried there, although, although I believe he's one of the most famous. Um, but there are several Hasidim rabbis that are buried there, and the cemetery is beautifully kept. Um, and it's a very meaningful experience. And I can tell you a personal story of Yeshua with Rabbi Chaim Zanvil um, that um, was, was just. After I read about him, I immediately uh, booked flight tickets for my entire family to go and visit his kever. I had no idea there was a tzaddik like that buried in America. And we went and we visited. And um, I was having a particularly difficult time finding quality employee to work for our office, for my, the company my husband and I run. And um, we had gone through several people and it was they were all disasters. And after I learned about the Ribnitzer, I, I made a donation of tzedakah to his um, yeshiva. And I lit candles for him and I asked for his help um, to go to Hashem and tell HaKadosh Baruch that we need somebody that we can really rely on and really trust and in a very short time after that I wound up finding a beautiful amazing wonderful woman who has been working with us Bezat Hashem, almost a year coming up in November and um, I, I, I say that the Ribnitzer was an integral part in finding her and um, I would highly recommend that you light a candle for the Ribna Sarebi today. Study about him a little bit. You can find information about him online. And um, he, his, the stories about him are just, they, they really give you hope um, uh, about, about the power of Tzadikim. And um, even, even in his passing, he, he's one of those Tzadikim who has dedicated himself to Am Yisrael, to helping Am Yisrael. So definitely, especially today, ask for what you need. Ask for his help to go to a Kaddish Baruch Hu. Ask for him to help make a Yeshua for you, whatever, whatever it is that you might need. So um, we, we send a tremendous Hakar Asatov to Hashem for bringing such a Tzadik into this world and for, for allowing him to continue to help us even after his passing. So Reb Chaim Zanville, the Ribnitzer Rebbe, buried in Muncie, New York. Um, it's definitely somebody for everyone to know about and to learn from. Um, I wanted to um, begin our shiur today. I would like to touch on two different things that I think are very, very important um, in the, in the, you know, now that the Chagim are in our rearview mirror, um, and I hope everyone can hear me. And again, please feel free to post in the chat or unmute yourself and speak or add. I'm, I welcome that at any time. Um, I wanted to kind of put my psychology hat on a little bit, um, my therapist hat, if you will, and just discuss for a minute or two um, about the idea of processing. Um, after we've experienced something. I think that so many of us, we put a lot of effort into preparing for the Chagim and then there's the physical work of the Chagim, which for women can often be very exhausting. And there's, of course, the spiritual work of the Chagim, which can also in its own way be exhausting. Um, we, I think we all share the desire to want to be better people, to want to be bigger souls, to want to um, fulfill our mission and our purpose and to achieve our potential and to specifically do that through the lens of Torah. Um, and living a Torah life and to utilize the tools that a Kaddish Baruch Hu has given us, which are, which are many, um, and, and, and several of those tools and instruments are ones that we've just used in the entire month of Elul and in, in Tishrei to date. And so we kind of go through all of this and we have our moments and we've made our lists and we've taken on our, our Kabbalos that we want to implement for the next year. And then... Today comes the day after, at least in the diaspora, the, in the Galus, the day after the Chagim go out. 
And I don't know about you guys, but I had a really, really hard time getting out of bed this morning. Um, I had a really hard time kind of like pulling myself up by the bootstraps and getting my day going and um, just, you know, I have these amazing intentions that I want to start davening at NITS and I still have that intention and I'm still going to try to work towards that. Um, but. The day after Chagim, I found myself in bed having a really hard time waking up and getting myself going, and thank God I did. But the point is that whatever goals we set for ourselves, we have to also understand that we're not robots and that we are human beings, and that a part of the experience of being a human being, of being a neshama in a human body, is that most of us, most of us, uh, there are a few that are exception, but most of us, it takes time and it takes practice and it takes patience to work up to where we want to be. And so if we take a Kabbalah on ourselves, for example, that we're going to light Shabbos candles early, or I, I didn't take it on as a Kabbalah about davening at nets because I knew it's going to be difficult for me, but it is an intention that I've set for myself. And then I've added a few tefillos, God willing, to my day and so on and so forth. That when we succeed, in reaching that, that milestone and that marker, uh, and we practice and we flex our muscles and we work to get ourselves to a new level spiritually and, and hopefully physically as well, then we should feel very good about ourselves and, and we, should, um, we should feel uh, satisfied in, um, in how we're moving closer to Hashem in our avoda, whatever that is that we are deciding for ourselves. But when we don't reach that bar, and it happens that we don't because things come up, because life happens, because, because there are unpredictable um, and unforeseen circumstances, or maybe we're just having a harder day, that we should still feel good about ourselves from the standpoint that it's in our mind and we want to do it. And some of the things I read over the Chagim was that the longing for desiring to do a mitzvah is just as precious to Hashem as actually doing the mitzvah. The fact that men go and pick up 30 or 50 or 100 different etrogim and look at them and study them and smell them and look at their color and look at their shape and look if they have any defects. This process of preparing for the mitzvah is just as precious to a Kaddish Baruch Hu as actually holding the lulav and the atrog and doing the shaking of the lulav and saying the brachos. And so we have to understand as women, we have a tremendous amount that we carry on our shoulders. And the expectations that we put on ourselves, let alone expectations others might have of us, is very, very high, generally speaking. And so we have to understand that we have to be kind to ourselves in our efforts to grow. So it's not about beating ourselves up because we happen to have missed mincha one day, because maybe the sun went down faster than we were anticipating, or maybe we forgot to say, Mashiva Ruach Umarida Gashem, which by the way, there could be an entire lecture just on that sentence. Maybe we'll do that one time. I read some incredible things about that. But we, we forgot to say that, and instead we say, Morita Tal. It happens. And so we have to just accept it, say, oh, okay, I made this error. I, next time I'm going to be more conscious of it, and I'm going to make uh, you know a, a fixing of that, and then I'm going to move on. The, the whole idea that when we're trying to strive and grow is not to beat ourselves up when we don't miss the mark. It's not that we should... Um, be casual about it and say, oh, well, you know, it's, it's not that. It's not a casualness, but it's a kindness. There's a difference between being casual and being kind. Being casual means you're kind of being laps or lackadaisical or, or not placing a high priority on it. That's not what we're doing here. What we are doing is that we know in our minds and in our hearts there's a high priority on wanting to grow and wanting to achieve and wanting to meet the Kabbalos we've taken on and wanting to build our Dvekos to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And at the same time having a kindness and a softness with ourselves and knowing that sometimes it might not happen 
and that's okay because like I said, we're not robots. And so um, it's always to know that we are wanting to strive to do our best. We are wanting to reach out to be able to grow. And at the same time, that that takes practice until it becomes something that we've integrated into our lives on a regular basis. The, the harsh judgments and the beating ourselves up is a tool of the Etzarhara. So it's, a, it's very important. We don't want to give energy, time, or any koach to the Etzarhara. And so when we do not meet the bar that we've set for ourselves, acknowledge it, try, you know, make a note, I want to do better, and then move on. And then do the best that you can to do better. Don't give koach to the Etzarhara. So this is, this is a really important note. And right now we're at the foundational level of the new year. And so as we process what we've learned and we've processed what we've put for ourselves in this coming year, this is the approach that I would like to see everyone taking, that we strive to do our best. Sometimes we may fall short. That's okay. That's a part of the human experience. As long as you maintain your intention and you maintain your level of dedication and, and desire and do not beat yourself up if you don't meet the mark. Um, so I hope that makes sense for everybody. Um, but I, uh, again, understanding that Hashem knows your heart. He knows every crevice of your mind. He knows every crevice of your heart. And if you have a pure intention and a desire that is as precious to him as the actual action that you will take. Um, and so hold on to that uh, dearly because, because it is, it is truth. Um, it is written and, and it is something that, that helps us to build our devekus to Hashem. So I hope that makes sense. If anyone has any questions or comments, as I said before, please feel free to jump in. Um, I wanted to share with you something, a tool um, that you can implement starting immediately that I read over the course of the Chagim uh, about Tehillim. So we all know that Tehillim is incredibly powerful. There are multiple stories I think I've actually shared a story, if not in this class, and definitely on some of my other recordings about um, the life-saving powers of Tehillim um, and how Tehillim helps to break through barriers uh, of all kinds in Shemaim um, and, and helps us to kind of clear the path for some of our other tefillos and also gives us a certain element of shmira of protection. So um, something I read that the Baal Shem Tov had told his students is that um, he always encourages people to read every day um, the Tehillim for your age. Now you have to remember that um, your, your birthday is actually in the arrears, meaning you're born at age zero. And so when you celebrate your first birthday, um, it means that you've completed one year. You're actually in your second year. So if you're, let's say, let's say you're age 40, you're actually going to be reading the Perak of Tehillim of 41. Does that make sense? Of the whole year. Um, and so the Baal, it doesn't give a tremendous amount of reasoning um, behind it, but you know, the Baal Shem Tov is the Baal Shem Tov. So if the Baal Shem Tov is saying that this is something that helps our neshama, um, then we can trust that it's most likely something that helps our neshama. So, um, so this is something that, as other Shem, I've started to take on adding to my daily davening that I will read, as other Shem, the Perak of Tehillim that is for my age. So um, I encourage all of you to kind of investigate that and explore that. So again, if you are age 50, you would be reading the Perak of Tehillim number 51, and you would do that on a daily basis. So it's just something to share with you guys, a little tip, a little trick um, that you can, you know, start to incorporate into your, into your daily routine if it's something that works for you. Um, okay. We are now a couple of days away from the Shabbos of Breshis, and it's one of my all-time favorite Shabbatot. Um, I find that uh, the Parshas of Breshis is uh, one of, um, wow, just uh, creation. <laughs> this is where it all starts to happen, and this is where Hashem starts laying the foundation and the groundwork for, for His creation, and where we start to get a glimpse of where we come from. And so I wanted to just talk, um, I wanted to pull from a couple different sources today uh, regarding specifically the Parsha of Breshis, and then I think we'll, we'll, we'll call it a day. Um, 
I wanted to start by by bringing from uh, Arav Avigdor Miller. Um, he writes in his weekly parsha about specifically about Cain and Hevel, and he's talking about Brachis, and he's talking about the idea that when you get into the story of Cain and Hevel, we obviously all know um, the tragedy that befell that that sick situation, that circumstance. But he's talking about the idea that Cain and Hevel, when they came with the idea of bringing offerings to a Kaddish Baruch Hu, and if you recall briefly, Cain came, Cain came with the idea of bringing Priha Adama, the fruit of the earth, as, a, as an offering. And then, of course, Hevel, learning from his older brother and looking up to him, came up with what wound up being, quote unquote, a better idea. And Hashem gave kind of preference to Hevel's offering of the best of his flock as opposed to the Priya Adama. And then we all know what happened from there, right? So jealousy ensued, sibling rivalry, and it, 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 it did not end well. The reason I'm bringing that up is because uh, Rav Avigdor Miller goes in into an entire segment about this idea of how we gauge and set the bar for ourselves. And it kind of ties into what I just spoke about at the beginning of the Shior in terms of setting the bar and trying to meet goals we've set for ourselves. He talks about that today in today's world, because we really haven't had the experience of being around these high, high, high level of tzaddikim uh, since the time of creation and, and forward until now. And that what we tend to do in today's world is we tend to think to ourselves, oh, well, you know, compared to the rest of the world, I'm really doing a great thing. Like, I'm Shomer Shabbat, I'm Shomer this, I'm Shomer that. I go to Shul, I light candles, I do, and the vast majority, unfortunately, of the Jews in the world are not doing those things. And so we have a tendency to compare ourselves to those that are doing less than us, as opposed to comparing ourselves to those who are and have done more than us. And this is a part of human psychology, actually, where we try to find ways to make ourselves feel okay about what we're doing, which on the one hand is fine. As I just said, we should feel good about what we're doing. We should feel, you know, a sense of satisfaction about what we're doing. But what Rev. Avigdor Miller brings here is the fact that we always want to be setting the bar high. We always want to be looking up as opposed to looking down. Meaning instead of comparing ourselves to the people who aren't doing, we have to be striving to compare ourselves to the people who are doing. And not so that we should feel less than or bad about ourselves, but so that we should feel motivated and inspired. And so when we see someone who's able to squeeze in a little bit more than what we're doing, we can look to those people. And that is exactly what Hevel was doing with Cain. Hevel was looking to his older brother to say, wow, look at this unbelievable idea that my older brother came up with. The idea of bringing a new offering to a Kaddish Baruch Hu. Rabbi Avador Miller talks about the fact that you have to understand these were novel ideas. It's not that they had books to read or anyone to look up to other than their own parents. These were ideas that came to them. Fresh, 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 fresh. They were not looking at someone else and getting these ideas. They were the creators of these ideas through the, through the blessing of a Kodesh Baruch Hu, right? But we have generations upon generations upon generations of people to look up to and to learn from, whether they've already passed or whether they're still living. And so his whole message is that we have to set the bar for ourselves in such a way that we're constantly looking up. We're constantly looking for people that we can learn from and that we can be inspired by and that can help to motivate us. Because if we look down, so to speak, and I'm using that metaphorically, of course, we're not going to look down on another person. We're not going to judge anybody. Everybody has their own path. Everybody is learning at their own pace. Everybody has had their own upbringing and their own background and their own things that they've been born into that a Kaddish Baruch Hu has the perfect plan for them. So when I'm using this terminology up and down, it's not at all chas v'shalom in a judgmental way. It's to say doing more or less, right? So we, we don't want to look to people who are doing less than us and then feel good because we're doing more. We want to look to the people who have done more and who are doing more to inspire us to grow. 
So he's saying that is where our vision should be. Our vision should be looking to those who have done more, not looking to people who are doing less so that we can feel good and say, you know what, I'm okay because in comparison to the people doing nothing, I'm, I'm like a tzaddik. Does that make sense? So, so it's, it's hard because, you know, as we know, and as it's written, and as everyone's discussing, we are the generation that is right before Mashiach, Bezod Hashem. And, and really, if you go deep into the texts and, and you listen to the shirim that are being put out there, we are really living in the time of the door of the Mabul. As we know that Hashem has to bring all the neshamot back. Everybody's got to come back. Because on the day of judgment, when Hashem is going to do Tchiyas Ametim Bezod Hashem, Every single soul on the planet, every soul that is in a human body, every soul in an animal body, every soul in, an, in a, a tree, in a fruit, in a fish, in a, in a, in a, in a rock, it doesn't matter. Every neshamos ever created is going to go passing through a judgment process. And, and on that day, it is, it is where we want to be able to say we've done the absolute most. And in today's world, when we are living in the time of the door of the Mabul, where all of these souls are coming back, right? So we are oftentimes, and I can say, I've said it before, I'm not shy about it, in the city where I live, in Los Angeles, you see it every single day. Every day, there's a new thing on the street. There's a new something or other that you're saying, how is that even possible in a sane world? Um, and the only reason it's possible that your eyes are seeing what they're seeing is because this is the time that we're living in. And so every single thing that we do matters so much. So even the smallest mitzvah, even the thought of a mitzvah moves mountains in Shamaim. And so we have to know that it's worth it for us to put forth that effort. It's worth it for us to continue to, to, to desire and to drive to grow and be better because every, sing, every single thing we do matters. Every effort, every thought, every pang in our heart when we feel for another human being, when we care about our fellow Jew, when we bless our fellow Jew. You know, Rabbi Avigdor Miller has so many different kind of analogies that he talks about, that when you see a Jew walking down the street, and in this case in Los Angeles, I'm very, very fortunate because I do see that very frequently where I live. I know in a lot of places in the world you don't see that so frequently and people have to hide their identity. But you know, they talks about when you see a man walking and you see a tzitzit hanging out, you see a kippah on the head, you see a woman wearing a shadal or a tichel, you see someone who's identifiably Jewish, you have to bless them, even if you don't know them. Just in your mind to think, Hashem, I wish them well, they're my fellow Jew, they're my fellow brother, they're my fellow sister. And even this action, this thought, of loving your fellow Jew and flexing that muscle of having Ahavas Yisrael and Ahavas Chinam absolutely does monumental things to, to bring Mashiach closer to us. So, so in summary from Rav Avigdor Miller, the idea being that we strive to look to people who are doing more so that they can inspire and motivate us and we don't compare ourselves to people who are doing less a, because we don't want to judge, and B, because we don't want to make ourselves think that, oh, just because they're doing less, that somehow we're okay with the level that we're at. There has to be a constant striving and desire to grow. So this is from Harav Avigdor Miller, Zichur Noli Vachad, Sadiq Gamor. Okay? Now, the other um, place I would like to take from for today is in this book called Growth Through Torah by Harav Zelik Pliskin. And um, this is an absolutely lovely, lovely book. If you don't have it, I highly recommend it. Um, I've read this book countless, countless times. Hi, welcome, Shana Tova. I've read this book countless times, um, over and over and over, Parsha after Parsha after Parsha. And um, I want to just pull a couple things from his chapter on Bereshis because it's, it's very, very powerful. And I feel like he always has the best little tidbits, little nuggets for us to, to grow from. So one of the first things he talks about here is in Bereshis, the idea of strengthening our resolve to be in control of our impulses. So he's talking about the idea that the Yetzer Hara, of course, the, the job, as we've discussed before, the job of the Yetzer Hara is to pull us 
off our path, chas v'shalom, to pull us away from our mission, to pull us away from our kabbalos, to pull us away from growth, to distract us with whatever he can so that we're not revealing Hashem's light in the world. That's his job. And he's very good at it, as I've said before. But what, what Rabbi Pliskin is talking about here is the idea that we can sometimes feel very overwhelmed by the power of the Yetzir Hara, very overwhelmed by the idea that if we have so many impulses to fight, so many things to overcome, how can we ever succeed? And he's saying, no, that's not the case. What he's saying is, anytime we feel like, God forbid, we cannot overcome, we have to check our internal motivation. And he brings an example, and I think it's a fantastic one. He says, he says, if, if, He's, I'm going to just read it straight from the book because I, I can't say it better than he, than he does. We find willpower in one of two ways, through reward and through punishment. Imagine that you have a strong compulsion to eat a certain food and find it extremely difficult to overcome your desire for it. And you think to yourself, it's impossible for me to not give in to my urge to eat this food. You hear yourself saying this in your mind. But if someone were to offer you a large fortune to control your compulsion for one week, you would probably find the internal motivation and strength in order to control that urge. So focusing on the reward will enable you to strengthen yourself, to steal yourself, to stick to overcoming whatever it is, obstacles that are put in front of you to keep you from the things that you've wanting to take on for yourself to grow spiritually. So he says, it's similar with the idea of punishment. If someone were to stand next to you, God forbid, with a loaded machine gun and told you that as soon as you eat that food, they're going to pull the trigger, chas v'shalom, it would all of a sudden not become impossible to not eat that food. It would not become impossible to not overcome. Because either way, you would end up losing your appetite for the food or you would be so... Um, so strengthened by your resolve that it would, it would become very doable to overcome. So either way, reward or punishment, we understand that one of the, those two drachim, one of those two paths would give us the koach that we need to achieve what we want to achieve. So he's saying it's really about finding that inner strength one way or the other to overcome our yetzer hara. And so you either have to think about the great gain that will come from achieving, or you have to think about the great loss, chas v'shalom, that would come from giving in to your Yetzir Hara. Now, what's brilliant is what he does is they take in the very next section, he brings the whole idea of awareness of olam haba. So if we have a deep understanding of what this olam, about what this life is about, that this life is merely, merely the foyer, the gateway to olam haba, right, which is really the real world, right, we're in this matrix of a system that Hashem puts us in this body, in this world, in order to achieve, in order to make correction, in order to fix, in order to grow, in order to build, and that the ultimate reward is going to be in Olam Haba after this lifetime when this Neshama leaves this body. So then all of a sudden he's saying, okay, now we get to put two and two together. Now we get to see all of creation, what it's about, what it's for. The idea of overcoming the Atzahara is through reward, understanding that every mitzvah we do, every time we take a step towards Hashem, towards Torah, towards fulfilling his directive of a Jewish neshama in this world. So then we are taking a step towards reward in this world and in the next, right? Now, for us, it's difficult. As human beings, we like to see immediate result. That's the nature of human psychology. If we don't see immediate result, it's very hard to continue. But if we keep in mind the ultimate goal, the ultimate direction of Olam Haba, and we understand that every action, every mitzvah that we do has a direct reward in Olam Haba, so then it becomes easier to digest. Even the challenges become easier to digest because we understand that we have Isurim Chas V'Shalom, we have challenges, we have Nisyonos, because Hashem wants to reward us in Olam Haba, but He cannot just give it freely. We have to earn it. 
And so our tickets, our tickets for those rewards are going through what we have to go through in this olam in order to get that reward in olam haba. And what Rabbi Pliskin is saying here is that if we keep this in mind, it strengthens our resolve. We understand we're not just doing these things stam, we're not just doing them dafka, we're doing them because we understand and we internalize and we believe. One of the Shlosh Yisrael Ikarim is that we understand there will be Tchiyas Ameistim, every Neshama will be judged, and those who are righteous and, and, and um, have earned their place will be receiving Olam Haba. Right? So, so he's saying that this is the motivation, this is the internal drive of a Jew, of a Yid, of a Neshama of a Yid, is to understand that we want to connect with the Kaddish Baruch Hu and we want to benefit from the Olam Haba. Okay? Now the, the, the flip side of that, of course, is, is Chas V'Shalom, is punishment, is Gehenna. Right? And you say, well, you know, how many times people talk about, oh, you're gonna, you're gonna, gonna go to hell, go to hell. It's a very Christian idea. They say, oh, everybody should be very scared of going to hell. But what you have to understand is Gehenna is a very real and serious thing. It's written about in all the Jewish texts, but in the context of Judaism, yes, it is considered a punishment, but it's also considered a cleansing. It just really depends on the degree to which, God forbid, God forbid, somebody would involved in that aspect of things, depending on what they did in this Gilgul, in this lifetime. So your motivation is exactly what he's saying. It's reward or it's punishment, right? It's literally the, the underpinning of human psychology. He's talking about all the underpinnings of human psychology. Reward, punishment, inspiration, motivation. You find it all right here in the Torah, all rooted in Parsha Sprashis. Okay? And so his whole point is anything we need to deal with in this lifetime becomes much um, I don't want to say easier. I think that's the wrong terminology. Life is not easy. I don't think there's anyone who would say they have an easy life. Okay. But it becomes more bearable. It becomes more comforting to know that when you go through things in this lifetime, you are earning Olam Haba. There is a reward for what you go through, the mitzvot that you do. And that makes it much more palatable and much easier to find your internal motivation to keep on going. Um, so one of the other things that he talks about, two things that I think are critically important, um, and then we'll end with this. Um, the first is that in order to grow spiritually, you must be willing to accept rebuke, right? You must be willing to participate in Musar. And Musar, of course, being when someone gives you feedback about your behavior, about something about your character. Um, and again, there are ways in which this is meant to be done. Someone who is just berating you, that's not, that's not constructive criticism. That's not constructive feedback. Um, that's just being belligerent. That's not what we're talking about here. Musar is generally done with love and care for the neshama of the other person. It should be done very carefully. It has to be done in the right time and in the right way. And it cannot be done. It's asur. It is asur to give musar to someone that you already know cannot hear you or will not hear you. So, so the idea of um, being a human being who is willing and open to accept constructive criticism automatically signals to Hashem that you're someone who wants to grow and desires to grow. And you can either seek out that Musar or it can literally be something that comes to you in an unexpected way. I'll give you an example of, my, of myself. In the month of Elul, and it was not lost on me that it was in the month of Elul. I happened to be in, a, in the box and mail shop here down the street. I had to send something to, uh, to Israel. And I had been the only person in the store with the lady behind the counter. And then another woman came in and I wasn't really paying attention. I happened to have been on my phone and um, I was trying to get the details of what I needed in order to send this package. 
and evidently I was being very loud. I, I was not a, a, aware of it, but you know, I guess I was talking loudly. Um, and so the lady next to me, she was probably, she was definitely older than me. Maybe she was in her late sixties, Jewish, um, didn't appear religiously Jewish, but Jewish. She, she had a star of David and she was carrying something like a Jewish calendar or whatever. I don't know. And, um, she made some kind of comment, um, out loud to me, but also to the lady behind the counter of how I was being somewhat obnoxious. She wasn't using those words, but by the tone of her voice telling me that I was being very, very loud, um, it was clear to me that that was her uh, message to me was that I was being uh, loud and, and, and obnoxious in her eyes. And, um, and I could have reacted in, in either way. At first, when she said it, I was, I was a little bit like, annoyed because of course when someone criticizes you your gut reaction is generally to be annoyed or to be defensive um, but then right away I tried to catch myself and and I said to her I said um, I said oh I'm, I'm very sorry if I'm um, I'm sorry if I'm bothering you and I think my voice had a little bit of a tone um, like a sarcastic tone I didn't mean for it to be but whatever human being so um, anyway she caught my tone and she kind of called me out on it and we started to have a conversation with each other. And um, I right away realized that, you know, I, I, I was in the wrong. I was in the wrong. I was not being mindful of my environment. And so um, by the end of the conversation, she and I were blessing each other and Shana Tova, and she was asking me questions about the Jewish calendar. And she's like, oh, maybe you can translate this for me. She had something in Hebrew and whatever. And um, it was very, it ended up being very nice. But, you know, I, I had to open myself to the idea of accepting Musar even from a complete stranger in a totally unexpected place, right? Nobody expects to really be given Musar in the package store when they're mailing a package. Um, and, and I took it to heart and, um, and I realized I needed to be, I took it as a message to be more mindful of my environment. And I've been working on it ever since. I'm not always successful, um, but, but I'm working on it. So my point is that when you open yourself up to accepting Musar, either from people that you love, um, then you become more mindful and it helps you to grow spiritually. And so, so this is something that, that takes practice. It's like flexing a muscle, building a muscle. The idea that you open yourself up when someone makes a comment to you, even if it's not in the nicest way, you try to see if you can take the pearl from the comment and leave the rest, right? And not, not buy into the attitude or the tone, but just pull the little pearl out and, and examine it and ask yourself, is it relevant? Is it true? What should I take from it? Because we know that nothing happens by accident. Hashem runs the world. And so even if a stranger is making a comment to you in the line in the grocery market or in the box and mail, you have to understand that comment is hitting your ears for a reason. Right? When you see something, you are seeing it for a reason. There are no accidents. So we can find Musar if we're looking for it, but only if we're open to it. Now, the flip side of this is being able and willing to give Musar. This is much trickier. Um, and, and I would say to be very careful with getting involved with this. But, you know, we have to always be raising our children, right? And so there's a certain element of Musar in that, uh, in parenting. Parenting is basically trying to raise another human being so that they become decent people in the world and, 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 and people that live by the, the, the laws and, and life of a Kaddish Baruch Hu that he's given to us. Um, so there is that part of Musar. There's, of course, things we want to share with our spouses. Very, very tricky because it has to be done with a lot of love and a lot of care and a lot of um, forethought uh, and certainly not in the heat of any moment um, has to be something that's that's planned in the right timing and then of course there's things that happen with our friends with our neighbors and so on and so forth so anytime you are about to give over Musar in any kind of way um, any kind of constructive criticism so I would say it's much more important to be open to accepting it as, than to give it um, but at the same time, be very, very mindful uh, of how, how you speak and if the person is even going to be receptive. Um, because 
God forbid you don't want it to, to, to backlash. The other part of it too is to always remember that when we see something in someone else, it's because it exists in ourselves. So before we're about to open our mouths um, to give Musar to another person, we have to say to ourselves, we have to really check ourselves to say, why do I want to share this with that person? Am I really doing this from a place of love or am I doing it to be critical and where do I see this existing in myself and is it something that I myself need to work on while I'm sharing it with someone else I, I hope that makes sense so if, if we cannot if we the only way we can see something in someone else is because it exists in ourselves that goes for good and for bad I forget which Rob it was, but there was a story. Oh, I wish I could remember. I'll, I'll the Zazer I'm going to look it up. But there was a story about um, a, a Rav who never saw bad in anybody, right? Because he was a total tzaddik. So there was no bad to see. He had no bad in himself. He could not see bad in others. And somebody was meant to go and ask him a question about uh, something having to do with somebody's bad nature. And, and, and his response was, what are you talking about? I've never seen that behavior. Um, I've never seen that behavior in that person, you know? He couldn't see it in the person because it didn't exist in himself. So we have to always be doing that check, you know, about what, what is it in ourselves versus what is it we're seeing in other people and what push, pushes our buttons, okay? Um, and so the last thing that he that brings up here, and, and this is, of course, I think we all know this, but it at this point, right after the Chagim, and as we head into hearing Parshas Bereshis Hashem this Shabbos, the last thing he brings is the, the quote from Bereshit, V'noach matzachen be'inei Hashem. And Noach found favor in the eyes of Hashem. And honestly, when we look at the entire summary of Parshas Bereshis, which it's, it's so rich, it's such an unbelievable Parsha, um, that we have to understand that that sentence, Venoach Matzachen Beinei Hashem, every single word in the Torah is on purpose. And so when something like this is mentioned at the end of the Parsha, we have to understand this is a directive for humankind. This is not just about Noach finding favor in the eyes of Hashem. We are all descendants of Noach. We are all coming down. So Abraham is 10 generations from Noach. We know that we are all born descendants of Abraham and Sarah. Abraham Avinu Sarah Imenu. Okay, so you had Adam Arishon, 10 generations, Noach, 10 generations, Avram Avinu. And we are all coming down from this lineage. If Hashem is saying, Noach Matzachen be, uh, Noach Matzachen be'inei Hashem, we have to understand that is our primary directive. That is the directive of the Jewish people is to Matzachen be'inei Hashem. That everything we do, we need to be caring about how we are viewed in the eyes of Hashem. It is, of course, very nice to be viewed well in the eyes of our fellow human beings, in the eyes of our, of our fellow Jews. But the number one concern is how we are viewed in the eyes of Hashem. And this is not always easy, right? Because we are the minority of the minority of the minority, right? Observant Jewish people on planet Earth make up 0. 0.0 something percent of the 0.2 percent of, you know, Jews in all the world. We are literally the minority of the minority of the minority. A few million people in the billions of, if that many, in the billions of the world. And so if your directive, if your goal, if your primary objective is to be someone who is found favorable in the eyes of Hashem, you have to know that you're in little bit of company. And so sometimes in your desire and your resolve to hold that as your primary objective, you can bump up against those around us who don't share that objective, who don't share that core value. And so that in and of itself is a test of our Devekus Hashem. It's a test of what we're willing to do in order to be Evdei Hashem, in order to bring Hashem's light into this world. And all of us can do that in varying degrees and in varying ways. Um, but to understand, they always, there's the, 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 the phrase that says, it's lonely at the top. Have you ever heard that? That phrase, it's lonely at the top, right? The CEO of a company with, you know, hundreds of thousands of employees doesn't have so many people to eat lunch with. 
right? You're going to find him usually eating lunch in a business meeting with someone he's trying to make a deal or eating lunch alone in his office. Why? Because it's lonely at the top. Because the people who are in charge, the leadership, the people who have to hold strong to their core value, their core mission, their core purpose to achieve what they themselves view, right? Not everybody can see what they see. Not everybody can share that core vision or their core mission. And so we have to understand that Am Yisrael as being meant to be the light among the nations, right? And there are few of us worldwide that are committed wholeheartedly to doing that. We have to know that in order to really fulfill our mission and our purpose, we may bump up against others. We will bump up against others and a society that does not necessarily share the Torah value and the core value by which we are striving to live our lives. But to not allow that to take you off of your path in any way, chas v'shalom, to understand that the primary directive is to find chen in the eyes of Hashem, to find approval in God's eyes first, and if you can also have approval in man's eyes, that's icing on the cake. But first and foremost is your relationship with Hashem, and to have that be what drives all your choices, all your decisions, all your relationships, everything you're bringing into this world, everything you're channeling, all the light you're bringing down is driven from your desire to find favor in the eyes of Hashem. And so as we move into this new year, as you reflect on the things you've taken upon yourself, as you reflect on the challenges that will come, because they will, because that's life, right? You'll have your successes, you'll have your days where you don't quite meet the bar. Remember, in summary, to constantly be looking for people who motivate and inspire you, to learn about our tzaddikim, past and present, to surround yourself with people that you can look up to. Don't compare yourself with people who are doing less than you, right? In order to make yourself feel good about that. That's not what we want to have the bar measured against. We are comparing to our own growth year after year and striving to build our relationship with Hashem. And from there, everything outward into this world and to cling, to cleave to the idea that even though we might struggle in this world, in this lifetime, to know that the ultimate reward, the ultimate reward will be, God willing, our Olam Haba. And I hope, as other Shem, that everything that we do will bring Mashiach faster. And if nothing else, bring light to Am Yisrael and to, and to help to, to help really build our nation as, as, as one people and for us to really ultimately reveal our light in this world as a light among the nations. So we can each do that as we've talked about before for ourselves, for our families, for our communities and that will spiral, it will ripple out. And we won't even know, we will not even know, we will not even know how far our impact goes. You know, um, that's something that in 120 years, when we go into Shemayim, God willing, we're going to see all the good we did and all the help that we, that we gave and all the mitzvot that we did and all the light that we shared. So that's what we cling to. We cling to those concepts as we move into this new year. And Be'ezot um, Hashem, really, I hope that all the, all the koach, all the strength, all the davening, all the work, the physical work, the spiritual work, everything you've done in Elul and up until this point in Tishrei, we're going to bring with us now. We're going to process, we're going to internalize, and we're going to keep pushing forward together. Um, Be'ezot Hashem that uh, it should be a tremendously blessed year for all of us, for all of Am Yisrael, and really for the entire world, because we need it. <laughs> the whole world needs it, needs Hashem's light, and needs Hashem's strength. So on that note, um, I want to just, you know, I'll open it up. If anyone has anything they want to share, they can say or want to post um, in the chat, please feel free. Um, uh, while you guys are doing that, I'll just say on a, on a, a calendar note, um, we have, uh, let me just quickly open up my calendar. Um, the we have the 26th the next week and then November 2nd. Um, and then uh, November... Oh, and November 9th. So we have three solid weeks, Bezat Hashem, that we hopefully will be able to meet. Then the following week, Bezat Hashem, I'm supposed to be in Israel. And I'll have to let you know whether or not I'll actually be able to do the class, Bezat Hashem, from Israel. Um, 
If I can, I will. Uh, if for any reason I can't, I'll definitely be in touch with you. But for now, we have three solid weeks before we have to worry about that at all. And Bezat Hashem, we will just push forward. Oh, you're in Israel now. Amazing. So say some, say some uh, davening for all of us. Um, you're, you're closer over there. You're, oh, you're living there. Oh, okay. So daven for us always. <laughs> daven for us always from Eretz Yisrael, Eretz HaKodesh, that we should all be there soon, Bezal Hashem. Um, okay. Any, any other comments, questions? No? Okay. Thank you guys all so much. It should be a blessed week, Bezal Hashem, and hopefully we will see each other next Wednesday, same time, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Okay? okay? Sending much love to everybody, and I'll put the recording on up there for anybody who, who missed it, okay? Shavuot Tov. Shabbat Shalom. Oh, thank you so much. Hello. Thank you. Bye.